This is the Tan Talk Radio Network. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Listen to the words of the man with the rifle in his hand. Don't be mistaken. I believe. This is Liberty Underground with Alex Snitker and Adrian Wiley on the 1787 Radio Network. Welcome back. Hour number two, Liberty Underground on the 1787 Radio Network. If you'd like to call the program, the numbers are 727-441-3000 or 866-826-1340. You can also listen live at 1787network.com. Joining us now... Brandon from the desk of Brian with what we missed in the news this week. Brandon, welcome. How you doing? Doing outstanding, Adrian. How was your week? Oh, well, uh, you know, just uh, fighting tyranny in every direction this week. Well, I tell you, it was really good to see the SOPA uh, boycott on Wednesday. And I think we, we reported it early on, on about Christopher Dodd's involvement with the MPAA and it really opened the doors, especially with Wikipedia and some of the large websites also protesting, to engage a lot of people in conversation about what SOPA really is and how easy it would be to shut down websites and having the government so intricately involved with the Internet. And I thought it really, really went well this week, and uh, I don't know what your thoughts are. Oh, absolutely. In fact, yeah, we didn't touch on that. We talked about some of the other sites that uh, uh, protested SOPA, but uh, Wikipedia actually went dark for an entire day. Mm -hmm. um over this which i thought was phenomenal and wikipedia if you've uh i've been an editor of wikipedia for a long time and and they are very stringent about uh copyright to begin with um if you're going to post an image or anything like that on wikipedia it, it truly has to be vetted and you have to show that that you have copyright to that material uh so for them to go dark in support of that uh, was a really big move. But uh, Brandon, deskobrian.com is one of those sites that would be on the, uh, I'm sure, on a short list of uh, uh, sites that would uh, be targeted by the Justice Department should SOPA pass. Yeah, we'd probably be, um, you know, pretty quick just because it doesn't take any more than an accusation for them to be able to pull you from Google search engines and, and uh, shut down your advertising funding and that type of thing. So it would be pretty... Uh, pretty quick to uh, really almost decimate a, a website of that magnitude. And the, the revenue, and I, I wrote about this, is the revenue through Google Ads and, and things like that, when you don't have big sponsors, it's not going to pay for an attorney or any mechanism to fight the legal system that it would take to get your websites back up and running. And, you know, while our intent is not to violate copyright laws, and, and we're trying to really, really be even more assertive, like you said, with Wikipedia, uh, headed into 2012, there's always a chance for a mistake. And that's where the law is written for really no gray area. And it's very difficult. It would be it would be very difficult to defend yourself. Yeah, yeah. And it would be uh, difficult to defend yourself under fair use, uh, which, uh, you know, news sites generally uh, do. But, uh, you know, even under those circumstances, all they need to find is, is one image or one link somewhere to something that is, uh, you know, questionable copyright, and you're done. Well, and I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist with this, but, you know, the movie the movie industry sends out tons and tons of promotional imagery and uh, material all the time. They do not require us to constantly refer back to them. Everybody knows what comes from Paramount. Everybody knows what comes from Universal and that kind of thing. However, one quick phone call from somebody who's angry about the content on a website, suddenly they realize that, you know, you have a poster that's not – but noted properly, or something like that, boom, it would fall into the criteria that the way the soap is written. So I would hardly be alone with the, uh, the problem, and I'm actually surprised there were not more pop culture and uh, news websites that uh, kind of boycotted along with us. Yeah, yeah, it seems like, you know, if you did have an image on your site that was uncopyrighted, they could just claim it was copyrighted by someone else, or they could lay a copyright on it themselves. And then shut your website down, even though you had like a something that was in the public do or in the free public domain. 
And most people have been very civil in doing this, and we went through a very difficult time at the end of 2011 with this, and the concern that arose from that dealing was that you could falsely claim you own copyright, and therefore I can grant Adrian permission to use it. It turns out that I didn't have copyright originally, so now, I'm in, now Adrian would be in a bit of a mess because the original author comes back at him with maybe a lawsuit or, in this case, with the SOPA guidelines, shutting him down completely. Right. And there's no due process, and the burden of proof is uh, on the accused, not yeah, on guilt, the originator. You're, you're, you're um, guilty first. You're innocent last. And it is written very much in that way. And like I said in the originally. Christopher Dodd's name on this, I think, really helped reach out to general public, from my experience, because people know who Christopher Dodd is. You don't have to be a liberty-minded individual to dislike Dodd's agendas for America and its future. Uh, general public, uh, even those, um, you know, a Glenn Beck, Rush, Rush Limbaugh listener, has kind of a, a disdain for uh, Christopher Dodd. So there really should be an appeal to really squash this bill and put this all behind us. Yeah, the only thing that would be worth worse uh, was if uh, Barney Frank uh, was on there too. But well, you know uh, they were running pro SOPA ads on MSNBC. Oh no, you're wow. kidding! Yeah, yeah, I got, I got it sent to me yesterday. I'm going to try to get to that today and, and screen it myself. But it's kind of a you know pro SOPA little thirty second ad, and I, I was I was just shocked that a news agency would really want to be that vulnerable. But the ties to GE and the ties yeah, to the government, yes. I mean, universal, it doesn't really surprise you if you do if you know the research and, and the handiwork. Oh yeah, yeah, it's you know all the the major media outlets are owned by these global conglomerates that have a vested interest in uh, promoting things like SOPA. But, uh, well, you know, there's not going to be there's not been any reports that uh, you know our 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 fever and response and uh, over Iran is still in high gear. We have two aircraft carriers now that are strategically positioned over there with fifteen thousand troops in Kuwait because of the pressures in Iran. And you know, I think in the Christian community, there really wasn't enough talk given to um, Ron Paul getting booed over the Golden Rule reference, and uh, we did a piece on that as well. And I think those two things, I think, really just were completely. Uh, overshadowed by Newt Gingrich, uh, Mitt Romney debates within the right wing and uh, the attacks from the left and that kind of thing. So check those out on Desk of Brian. And as always, I know, Adrian, you always want to go to a, a weird news story. Oh, well, stand by. This this week there's something else that caused my, caught my interest. But, yeah, it, listeners, I, I want to just say uh, that's one thing you may have missed in the news this week is that we are building up troops in Kuwait as we speak. And if you go to deskofbrian.com, you can read all about it. Uh, so the, the war drums for Iran continue. But um, where I want to uh, talk to you first, uh, Brandon, is uh, this editorial piece you have on here about DHS and the Department of Education Partnership. Can you touch on that a little bit? Um, well, you know, I, I, I think there's a great article there. It's written by Ju uh, Judy Aaron. She's one of our contributors. And I think wh where, where I think people um, – uh, tend to don't understand about you know the Obama administration, the Bush administration is they're very protective of these uh, departments and they intermingle their powers and you know you have someone like Ron Paul it's like I'm going to get rid of these departments this is why it is so extreme to them because they will intermingle you know the concepts of terrorism uh, protecting our students um, what will be taught in schools and this is a great article that kind of helps dive into how they will strategically align these departments together for really a more authoritative state power and i think it's a very um, interesting article and i was more than happy to uh, have a great writer like her to contribute it yeah it's and the program is called Countering Violent Extremists, where the Department of Homeland Security is going to go into public schools and teach children how to identify potentially terrorist behaviors. And as we've talked about on the show in the past, you know, things like uh, having more than seven days worth of stored food or paying with cash, potential terrorist activities. Kids, turn in your parents. Uh, but, uh, OK, Brandon, let's uh, let's hit a weird news one real quick. It looks right. like some you, you good ones this week. got a drunk driver, <laughs> and he pulls off the road. And there's other people that know he's drunk, and they follow him into the parking lot. He tries to get back into his car. He gets belligerent because they can't stop him. They actually have a bystander who hog ties the man. 
<laughs> and that's the language that was used in the arrest record. It was that he was physically hogtied. That's awesome. I think that's absolutely hysterical to put. You know, how 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 does that feel to go downtown? You got your mug shots. What are you in for, man? I was hogtied for drunk driving, bro. That's and fantastic. It, it's in New Mexico, so you picture a guy riding up on the horse and lassoing him. You know. You know. Yeah, it was, it, I'm sure it was not to that extreme, but that is exactly <laughs> how it was worded all the way through the records. It was fantastic. As, as someone who's from New Mexico, born and raised, uh, yeah, no, Adrian. Um, um, but uh, yeah, there uh, DUI is a big a big problem in New Mexico. It used to have one of the highest rates overall uh, out of the country, and I think it still has the highest rate per capita. Wow. Hmm. Well, Brandon, as always, thanks for the uh, what we missed in the news. And folks, you can go to deskofbrian.com. dot com. Great website. Make it part of your daily news gathering uh, sites. And, uh, Brandon, we will talk to you again next week, sir. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good weekend. Take care, brother. All right. uh, We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we'll have more interesting stuff, and uh, hopefully we'll get into the conversation about what should be done with intellectual property. Should it exist? We'll find out when we get back. You're listening to Liberty Underground on the 1787 Radio Network. This is the Tan Talk Radio Network. Give your website a facelift. Visit OYOVA.com today. Are you looking for a copier, printer, fax machine, scanner, or multifunctional device? Or do you need a company that will come in and service your existing fleet? Well, Light Source Imaging Solution is that company for you. Light Source offers best in class products and local service to help enhance productivity and efficiency for every job that needs to be done in the office. We understand our clients' needs and apply the appropriate hardware, software, and technology to create a customized solution right for you. If you'd like to schedule an appointment, dial 727 729 2971. That's 727 727- 729-2971. Light Source Imaging Solutions. Hey, Uncle Anthony. Hey! It's my nephew. I've been thinking. I need to be able to defend myself and my family, so I think I need a gun. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Look, I don't know nothing about guns, okay? Call Galati Guns. At Galati Guns, they offer concealed weapons classes, are well-trained, and will help you make a smart choice. Galati Guns. U.S. 19 across from Sam's Club in Newport Ritchie, 727-645-6993. Galati Guns believes an armed society is a polite society. The Great Collapse draws near. Are you prepared? Financial system and currencies around the world are in trouble. The federal government debt is now above $15 trillion, mathematically impossible to pay off. Politics and power seem to be more important than solutions. So what is the end game? Asset Preservation Institute is preparing individuals for the transformation of America, the collapse of the currency, and the prolonged hyperinflationary depression. Visit www.assetpreservationinstitute.org or call 727 329 0048 for a free private discussion and learn what you can do and should be doing right now to protect and preserve your assets. Visit assetpreservationinstitute.org or call 727-329-0048. The great collapse draws near. Are you prepared? This is Adrian Wiley, chairman of the Libertarian Party of Florida. The LPF has a renewed mission, and we have the right plan to restore individual liberty and economic freedom in Florida. The time is right to end the two-party stranglehold on the people. We're doing our part. Now it's time for you to do yours. We need candidates. We need volunteer workers. We need money. We need you, and we need you now. Join the Libertarian Party of Florida today by visiting lpf.org. That's lpf.org. Only with your support can we... We, the people, restore our constitutional republic. Hey, Ed, have you checked out the new 1787network.com website? Yes, I have. Looks good, doesn't it? Great. Oh, man, thanks. Hey, I'll tell you why. It's because we called Oyova to rebuild it for us. It was the best decision that we could have made. Oyova, spelled O-Y-O-V-A, did it in no time flat. They worked with us using a real-time online interface where we could watch each step of the redesign and collaborate to ensure a seamless transition. Plus, from start to finish, it was only three days. Three days. Compare that to the weeks many web design companies take. They improved our logos and gave our website the professional touch it was lacking. Oyova can do the same for you. Visit OYOVA.com to create your new website or to supercharge your existing website. That's OYOVA.com. Tampa Bay's Tan Talk. Entertaining and informative radio for the Sunshine State.
Welcome back to Liberty Underground on the 1787's radio network. If you'd like to call the program, the numbers are 727-441-3000 or 866-826-1340. You can also listen live at 1787network.com. And even if you don't want to listen live, if you're listening to us in the car on uh, the AM band or uh, listen to us on our uh, new station in Arkansas, 94.5 FM, um, still, when you get the chance... Go to 1787network.com, check it out. Podcasts of all the shows are there if you miss something, plus a lot of great articles. Uh, We've got uh, 12 different writers and contributors to that site, so there's always a lot of good liberty-minded information out there. Um, One of the things I wanted to uh, let everyone know about is uh, we've got a couple of really big events the Libertarian Party of Florida does Um, Coming up real soon here, first and foremost, is the 2012 Libertarian Party of Florida State Convention, which is going to be February 10th through 12th at the uh, Embassy Suites Airport in Orlando, Florida. And uh, that's our annual convention, our annual business meeting. Uh, We're going to be uh, electing some uh, members of our executive committee. Uh, But really, the highlight of that weekend is going to be the... uh, the largest and most comprehensive Libertarian Party presidential debate held yet. And uh, the uh, candidates that uh, have confirmed so far are uh, Leroy Saunders of Georgia, R.J. Harris of Oklahoma, Roger Gary of Texas, Governor Gary Johnson of New Mexico, uh, Carl Person of New New York, Bill Still of Virginia, and Lee Wrights of Texas. Uh, Folks, this is going to be a great debate. Uh, We're doing this right. We're doing this professionally. Uh, We're going to have this thing uh, nationally televised. Uh, You don't want to miss it. Again, that is uh, February 10th through 12th in Orlando at the Embassy Suites Airport location. And uh, come on out. It's going to be a great event. Uh, If you're a libertarian and you're interested in being a delegate to the convention, uh, please uh, get in touch with Greg Lennon, the Libertarian Party of Florida secretary. And uh, there's a uh, form you can fill out in advance. That's available at 1787network.com forward slash LPF. Again, 1787network.com forward slash LPF. Uh, you can also go to the LPF website at lpf.org. Uh, there's uh, information there. Just click on the link for the 2012 state convention. Uh, Another thing I want to announce is next Friday, uh, we will have a Libertarian presidential candidate, Bill Still, uh, in studio, and also we'll be doing an event. Uh, The event will be at uh, 6 o'clock p.m. in Clearwater. Uh, Bill will be giving a uh, presentation at the Daytech Center in Clearwater. And afterwards, we'll be heading over to uh, Quaker Steak and Lube at about 7 o'clock for a meet and greet and hang out, have some wings, have some... uh, beers or cocktails and uh, just have a good time and it's your opportunity to uh, you know to question one-on-one one uh, one of the libertarian presidential candidates and uh, as you know uh, we've had bill still on the program in the past he's the author of uh, the secret of oz and uh, the uh, money masters is that correct lauren the money masters is uh okay yes uh yeah well I'm familiar with The Secret of Oz. Okay. But, but uh, yeah, great uh, author and uh, documentary director. So come on out to that. That is uh, next Friday, the 27th, at 6 o'clock at the Daytex Business Center on 49th Street in Clearwater. We'll have more information on that on the uh, 1787 Network website. Now, I want to just take a minute and reach out to Ron Paul supporters. Um, quite frankly... Let me tell you where I stand on Ron Paul. I think uh, I think we've discussed this on the past. I agree with the majority of Ron Paul's uh, positions. I think he's a great guy. I think he's a great voice for liberty. I think he made a huge strategic error by trying to run in the Republican Party. Um, there's, you know, there's there's no way this guy is going to be allowed the Republican nomination. So, should that happen? Should Ron Paul not get the nomination? And, uh, you know, he's he said repeatedly that he has no intention of running third party. In fact, it's too late for him to run as a libertarian at this point. I want to reach out to you guys. And I want to say, you know, I, I re- highly respect everything you're doing for the Ron Paul campaign. But should he not get the nomination, you absolutely need to support the libertarian 
presidential candidate. Um, you know, we've got, uh, for example, we've got Gary Johnson right now, who in a national poll is at 9% right now uh, in a three-way race between Mitt Romney, who probably will be the Republican nominee, Barack Obama, and Gary Johnson. Gary Johnson right now today, even with, uh, you know, the, the Ron Paul supporters still still out there, are is at 9%. So if you guys, if, if your guy doesn't make it in the Republican Party, if you come over, we got a shot at this thing. We have a chance to really make a difference this time around. Uh, we've got a candidate that is right now polling at 9% nationally. That's a big deal, folks. And with your help, if you put the same kind of enthusiasm and the same type of effort behind the libertarian presidential candidate, we could win this thing in a three-way race in the general election. So I just want you to think about that. So if things don't work out, remember, Ron Paul supporters, you have a home in the Libertarian Party. So, um, all right. So I just uh, wanted to get that uh, little bit of housekeeping out there. And uh, we're going to go to break right now. And when we get back, we're going to talk with, uh, we have that confirmed? Yes, we do. Okay. And we're going to talk with uh, Stefan Kinsala. Correct. Okay, and he's going to talk to us about intellectual property. You're listening to Liberty Underground, and we'll be right back. Come to the side that the things that I tried were in my life just to get high on. When I sit alone, come get a little known, but I need more than myself this time. This is the Tan Talk Radio Network. Are you looking for a copier, printer, fax machine, scanner, or multifunctional device? Or do you need a company that will come in and service your existing fleet? Well, LightSource Imaging Solution is that company for you. LightSource offers best-in-class products and local service to help enhance productivity and efficiency for every job that needs to be done in the office. We understand our clients' needs and apply the appropriate hardware, software, and technology to create a customized solution right for you. If you'd like to schedule an appointment, dial 727-729-2971. That's 727 727- 729-2971 Light Source Imaging Solutions American Standard Playing Cards is the official playing cards of the 1787 Radio Network. No jacks, queens, and kings. Now it's we the people, gentlemen, ladies, and patriots. Throw out the old tyranny suits. Now there is faith, declaration, revolution, and unity. These cards will etch the Constitution in the hearts of every American. Check out their two-minute intro at AmericanStandardPlayingCards.com. That's AmericanStandardPlayingCards.com. That's AmericanStandardPlayingCards.com. New technology is being unveiled by the 1787 Radio Network. The Liberty Underground Show is offering you, our sponsors, special rates on subliminal advertising. You will buy advertising from us. Studies show that subliminal advertising is 8,412% more effective than standard radio ads. You will write us a check today. Call 1-800-575-1787 today. Call it now, right now. For more information on your sponsorship opportunities, that's 1-800-575-1787 to get your ad running today. This is Alex. Let me tell you about a new sponsor that we have, ronpaulproducts.com. If you're looking for bumper stickers, T-shirts, car decals, wristbands, magnets, license plates, banners, signs, buttons, whatever, big custom kits, bulk sales, if you're out there trying to restore the Republican health, this guy win the election, this is the one place that you can go to get phenomenal product at bottom basement prices. This is a local guy here in the Florida area that is a big supporter of Ron Paul that put this website together for you to be able to get the things out. So go to Ron Paul products.com and get your materials there again that's ron paul products.com hey ed have you checked out the new 1787 network.com website yes i have looks good doesn't it's it great oh man thanks hey i'll tell you why it's because we called oyova to rebuild it for us it was the best decision that we could have made oyova spelled o-y-o-v-a did it in no time flat they worked with us using a real-time online interface where we could watch each step of the redesign and collaborate to ensure a seamless transition plus from start to finish it was only three days three days compare that to the weeks many web design companies take. They improved our logos and gave our website the professional touch it was lacking. Oyova can do the same for you. Visit OYOVA.com to create your new website or to supercharge your existing website. That's OYOVA.com. 
This is Adrian Wiley, chairman of the Libertarian Party of Florida. The LPF has a renewed mission, and we have the right plan to restore individual liberty and economic freedom in Florida. The time is right to end the two-party stranglehold on the people. We're doing our part. Now it's time for you to do yours. We need candidates. We need volunteer workers. We need money. We need you, and we need you now. Join the Libertarian Party of Florida today by visiting lpf.org. That's lpf.org. Only with your support can we the people restore our constitutional republic need more than smoke signals sign up for the liberty underground weekly newsletter at 1787network.com tampa bay's tan talk entertaining and informative radio for the sunshine state sitting and staring out of the hotel window got a tip they're gonna kick the door in again i'd like to welcome back to liberty underground on the 1787 radio network all right, if you recall, a couple weeks ago, uh, Loring and I were having a discussion about intellectual property rights. And uh, we went back and forth for a while, and, and Loring said, you know what, I'm going to bring in an expert to back my side of the argument. Loring is uh, of the uh, opinion that there should be no intellectual property rights, and sure. I'm kind of on the fence. I, I see uh, see validity on both sides. So we wanted to uh, bring in intellectual property attorney uh stefan kinsella uh stefan welcome to the program thank you very much glad to be here uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do kind of set up the the background of, of how you came to your position on this uh yeah what i do i'm an attorney i'm a patent lawyer registered patent lawyer and i've also done copyright law and other types of it law uh, over the years i've been practicing for about 18 19 years now uh since 90 uh 92 or so um, I've been a libertarian for quite a long time, and uh, initially I was um, uh, pro-IP because I assumed that that was part of the system of property rights in the uh, you know in the Western capitalist system, and because uh, I'd read Ayn Rand, et cetera, and she was strongly in favor of patent and copyright. Um, but I always had trouble with her argument because it seems sort of arbitrary to have a 17-year term for patents and. Uh, X year term for copyright and to let the first guy get it and all this. And so I, I thought there might be a better argument for it. And I kept thinking about it in law school. And when I started practicing patent law, I started thinking about it more and finally came to the discovery uh, upon learning more Austrian economics, more about property rights, that the whole thing is just a big mistake. And uh, the reason it's difficult to justify it is that it is actually not compatible with property rights. Um, you can't justify it. It's basically the relics of the ancient uh, system of mercantilism where the government would grant monopolies, monopoly privileges, and also uh, have different forms of thought control and censorship uh, to prevent the spread of ideas that they didn't want um, spread. And that's what we have now, the relics of this system. And, of course, the people that benefit from it are going to push hard for it. But basically they're the recipients of monopoly privileges that undercut the property rights of other people in the economy. Now, uh, let me ask you this, because in my yeah. mind, I equate uh, intellectual property to tangible property. If I create something, if, if I um, you know, take raw materials and turn them into a product, I have the right to sell that product. How does intellectual property differ from tangible property? And this, this is something I struggle with, too, and I finally realized that there was another mistake, and that is... Um, the sort of uh, imprecise usage of just what you, you said about uh, if you produce something or create it and you own it. Um, but the problem is that's actually not true. You're not the owner of the product that you produce because you created it. In fact, you mentioned the raw materials, right? So to, in order to produce something just means to transform raw materials, but you have to already own those raw materials, so you own the raw materials because you found them or because you homesteaded them or appropriated them from the state of nature, let's say, or because you purchased them from someone else. But then you used your labor, your intellect, your creativity to transform it into a more valuable shape or more valuable configuration. Now, you own that thing that's produced because you already owned what went into it. So the act of creation doesn't actually give rise to more property rights. It just makes your existing property more valuable. Um, so if you realize that creation is not a source of property rights, then you never really get to that analogy by saying, well, if you, if you own things that you produce because you create them, then you own valuable ideas because you create them. 
Uh, so actually, if you just realize that creation is not a source of property rights, only contract and discovery, basically, appropriation of unowned things is a source of property rights. Um, and furthermore, we don't really – if you create an idea, it's always based in part on the ideas of others. Uh, no one starts in a vacuum. Everyone stands on the shoulders of others. Almost all improvements are incremental. Shakespeare's plays were rehashings of a lot of existing plots and ideas in the culture at the time, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so no one is a, a create a hundred percent responsible for the ideas that they come up with in the first place. Well, I, I have a problem with that. First of all, it seems to me uh, when you argued that, um, and, and rightfully so, that when I take uh, raw material, I chop down a tree on my property or I purchase lumber uh, from a third party and then transform that into a wooden chair that I want to sell, you're right. I just have transformed that and added value to it. Um, however, intellectual property is is kind of the, you, you take away all the raw material aspects because that is something that you created from and granted it's based on if, if we didn't have the English language I couldn't write a novel granted there are things that is built upon but that thing itself is completely unique and there were no other raw materials involved other than things that came from the individual who created it how do you respond to that well, I think you're partly right, and, and I'm not denigrating the importance of ideas, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with or uh, uh, appreciate uh, or, or value the, uh, the Austrian way of looking at things. But oh, absolutely, yeah. So Mises' is the structure of human action is helped me to see this more clearly. What, And this is not that esoteric or complicated, but basically he says, look, what is human action? It's an attempt in a world of scarcity, which is what we live in, to try to change the state of affairs – Right in the future for what they otherwise would be. Every action is an attempt to get something done. It's seeking some goal that you find desirable or more satisfactory. And the way you do that is you use scarce means, which is your body and other things in the world, you know, like a shovel or you know, tools, uh, capital goods, to accomplish the end. But what you decide to ch- to pursue and what means you select to achieve your ends is guided by your knowledge. So the knowledge in your head helps to guide your action, but your action is employing scarce means. Now, these means are scarce, and that means we need property rights because otherwise people would only be able to f- have to fight over them to be able to use them. We all want to live in c- civilized society and be able to use things productively and peacefully, so we allocate owners to these things that otherwise only one person could use at a time and otherwise people would have to fight over. But ideas can be used by any number of people at the same time. So if you think of an analogy, two people uh, want to make a sword. Well, they can both have their own metal and and hammer it into a sword, and both using the same idea that, hey, if I hammer this metal into a sharp object, that it can be useful to me. So if I see you making a sword and I learn that that's possible, I don't take anything from you by emulating or copying you. Same thing if you know you're the first person to build a house made out of log log uh, logs, a log cabin. And when people have been living in caves before. Everyone gets the idea, hey, that's a great idea, or using fire to cook food. Ideas spread, and they enrich human society. Um, And actually, as capitalists or as property rights advocates and free marketeers, we should be in favor of people learning and competing with each other. And basically all that copyright and patent do is stop people from competing. In fact, the proponents of copyright and patent admit this. They say that we can't have unbridled competition. You know, it can't be too easy to compete with someone. If if, if I see you making a, a smartphone with a touch screen, you can't make you can't make the same thing because then uh, it's just not fair. Well, of course that's fair. That's the free market. But I would argue uh, that eliminating all intellectual property would actually ensure monopolies in a lot of cases. Uh, take this uh, example. Um, I write a novel. And I'm just one guy who sits at my computer in my kitchen and writes this unique, uh, you know, work of fiction, never been created before. It's it's a it's a novel. It's an original and it's awesome novel by Adrian Wiley. Yeah. And if you're waiting for me to write a novel, don't hold your breath. But just for this analogy. um, So I take that novel 
And of course, I want to be able to benefit from my creation. I want to be able to profit from it. Without the protection of copyright, for example, I lack the ability to uh, print 100,000, a million copies of this novel to sell. So without that well, that's protection, not true. you could you can you could print you could print as many copies as you want. No, no, no. You I, do have the ability. Well, I do. However, I don't. And you can sell I like them, right? The, you can, I you like, can sell them. There's no law against selling them. Well, hang on a second. Let me let me finish through. Okay. Um, I lack the resources to do that on my own. Now, what I can do currently is I can go to a publisher and arrange a deal with the publisher since I have copyright to the material. Say you print these books for me. Without that copyright protection, there would be nothing to prevent the publisher from cutting me, the creator of the work of art, out of the equation. And the the reason I say that it would actually inspire monopolies is because um, every new creation, as soon as somebody put it out there, it would be taken by whatever company could produce the most books in the shortest period of time and get it to the market first. So I would lack the resources on my own to get it to market first. Someone else would beat me to the punch. How would you address that problem? Well, I think it's just, uh, first of all, most authors don't really make that much money off their books anyway. And if they go to a publisher, the publisher gets most of it already. Um, Some authors, a very small number, make a good deal of money. Let's take J.K. Rowling, for example. Now, J.K. Rowling, in a copyright-free world, what could she have done? Um, let's say she, she, she – I don't think she wrote the books thinking she was going to become a billionaire. She did it because she loved writing and she was into this world, and that's what makes a good writer anyway. So she, let's say she would have published her first couple of books and just sold them and made a little money, um, uh, and maybe they got pirated. But they, if they became very popular, which pirating could actually help, then after the second book, she could be internationally famous, and all these children love her. She could She could send out a note. Listen, um, I've got books three and four written and ready to go. As soon as they get 100,000 subscribers for $10 a piece or something like that, um, or let's say the books came out and she made money on these kind of ways, um, some mo- some people started making movies of the books. You might have three movies of the, of the first novel in the same year by different companies because they wouldn't need her permission. Well, one of them might go to her and say, listen, we'll pay you a million dollars if you will – consult with us and, and authorize this because we think we can draw more of your fans because they'll go see the movie that is authorized by you. I mean, there's lots of ways you could profit. Or maybe she can get a job teaching English in a department because she's famous now and she's shown that she knows how to write. But There's the, different ways to profit off of your Your entire your premise is predicated upon the fact that she would originally have been come, become known for writing the first book. What I'm saying is if someone took that from her right off the bat she would never have the ability to gain any uh, either notoriety or, well, yeah, well, her name or would still be on it. it i mean if you if you pirate someone's work you don't change the name well, well, I, you you could. there would be nothing issue. to prevent that. well i have a counter for that adrian if if somebody if there's a publisher that's known to go sniping people's works and publishing it under their own name or or, or whatever the case may be and and uh, you know cutting the original author out of it authors and and people who really write good works are not going to go to this publisher any longer and this publisher will go out of business if they can't create their own works well, not only that, look, consider right, right now there are public domain works like Plato's Republic, let's say, or the Bible. Now, there's nothing preventing you from publishing, uh, you know, John Smith's uh, Republic and trying to sell it, but no one's going to buy it because they want to buy the original thing by Plato. And they're going to think you're kind of a, a kook, and if you're going to change the name of the author, what else are you going to change? I mean, if she puts it out there on the Internet first and publishes it on, on the Kindle or on, on iBooks or something like that, She's already got to establish a record of that she's the owner. I mean, not the owner. She's the author. Uh, so if someone wants to knock her off, they're going to just keep her name on it. I mean, when you, when you go to these little alleys in uh, China and places and buy knocked off CDs, it doesn't say uh, uh, you know Zoo by some. It, they put the name of the, of the of the creator on there so that people know what they're getting. Well, that's actually a fair point. Uh, you're you're right about one thing. In the internet age, it does give. Uh, the individual with meager means, the ability to get their original content to a huge number of people. So actually, yeah, you, you kind of in that vein, because um, one of the things that, that my biggest concern is, is that the the creator of the content 
would be cut out of the loop by someone who has greater means. But with the advent of the Internet, if, if uh, SOPA and PIPA are stopped, uh, perhaps, um, you know, the individual who created the content could get it first to market and have a huge audience before yeah. anyone else could take the idea yeah, and I, take credit for it. Yeah, that's a great example of this. Louis C.K., who's a, a fairly well-known comedian. He's not famous like, you know, Madonna or anything, but he's a fairly well-known comedian. Uh, I don't think he's hyper wealthy, but he has this comedy show. He does one a year, and he – I don't know if you heard what he did. If you go to Louis, louisck.net, I think, or just search for Louis C.K. on Google, he – about a month ago, he he he, uh, he had done this annual comedy show, and he recorded it. And uh, he spent about $30,000 um, to have a website developed so that he could easily sell this. No DRM, no nonsense, no limits. You just download the file. For five dollars on PayPal, very simple, and he spent about two hundred thousand on the show. But he actually got that back in tickets the night of the show. So really, he was out thirty thousand. He made a, over a million dollars in downloads in about two weeks, uh, and I don't know what he's made since then because that was about a month ago. And he he put it on his web. He explained it. He said, "Oh, I made a lot more than I thought, so I'm going to give uh, five hundred thousand dollars to these four charities." And the and because I'm I'm only going to keep two hundred fifty k for myself because that's really all I I, I needed. And the other 250 k I'm going to split it among my staff and give them a big, fat Christmas bonus. And uh, and so now the work's probably being pirated. But so what? He made this, and he's probably still selling it because it's easy. Um, if people make their work easily accessible, people are willing to pay for it just as a convenient service, even without copyright. Indeed. Um, and, Stefan, you know, and, the example I gave uh, two weeks ago was uh, Radiohead using the freemium model by putting out their uh, album for download and, you know, telling their fans, hey, if you like this album, send us a few bucks. And they made more on this album than they did on any of their previous albums. Yeah, and the other thing I would point out is that there's a lot of creativity that is stifled right now by copyright. So, for example, who knows what kind of remixing type musical techniques uh, would be ha- would be used if people weren't afraid to. Uh, and how many document have you heard of all these documentaries that are made and then they have to get blocked because someone in the background there's a billboard or a painting on a building and someone claims copyright and and. Um, you can't even film in front of buildings now because some people claim copyright in these things. Right. So there's all these blockages of creativity that would be unleashed. So, yeah, some people would lose the monopoly ability to sue other people for for doing something with their own property. But on the other hand, they would be more free to use works of others and build on it. Well, there's no doubt that it's been taken to the, uh, to the extreme at this point. It, I don't know. I still kind of struggle with it. I, th- I think that individuals that create something original should uh, should have uh, some recourse to prevent people. But then again, you, you bring up some interesting points. But, uh, Stefan, uh, we've got uh, someone that would like to weigh in. Uh, let's take a call. Steve in <laughs> Pensacola, you're on the air. Hi, Adrian. Uh, hi, everyone. Hey, um, uh, if, if I understand what he's saying correctly, um, I may be wrong, but – what he's saying is by leaving it open like that, that's almost uh, either uh, – it could either go extreme anarchist or, extre- or, or almost Marxist because, uh, because um, under, under, a, um, under our Constitution and under the concept of freedom, you have the right to protect that which is yours. You, um, uh, if you can go back to the, to the original arguments of John Locke versus Thomas Hobbes, um, you uh, – if, if you were to maintain all the freedoms that you were to have without government, uh, that would mean the ability to protect your, your property. Now, the property under that uh, uh, that we're talking about here, yes, it's it's it's, it's not physical, it's not it, it's intellectual, but um, in in, uh, in the way that you would probably without government is is somebody would have to come to you because um, if we didn't have the technology and so forth like we did, but it is still your idea. If um, and just like the person who who needed work um, with um, you know they'd go to a blacksmith. The blacksmith knew how to do it. Well, uh, they, he couldn't. He, they couldn't produce um, multiple blacksmiths on a, on a copier like that. But when when you effectively when they say no, you can't protect it. That is like government you know, kind of in a passive way saying no. You can't. You can't. Uh, protect your own property that way. Stephanie, you got a response well, I mean, for that? 
Yeah, let, let me let me just tell you the pers- where I'm coming from. Um, there's, there's a lot of things rolled into there. First of all, patent and copyright were never called property until about 100-something years ago when uh, a, a propaganda campaign was launched by the government to, to defend it. Everyone saw them as monopolies and as a derogation or as an exception to regular property, and people were nervous about that. And so um, – uh, and uh, it's not Marxist. What My perspective is radically pro-property rights, pro-capitalism. And pro free market, um, uh, and the and the reason I'm against patent and copyright is because they infringe on property rights. They basically give people that hold these monopoly grants from the state. Okay, that's more like Marxism. That's more like communism. The state grants these monopoly privileges that allows people to go to the government courts and sue other people on the market who are, for just using their property the way they see fit. Um, in fact, um, John Locke did not believe that. Copyright and patent were natural rights. His homesteading theory said that we have scarce resources in the world, things that uh, only one person can use at a time, and the only fair way to have a society be able to use these resources productively is to assign ownership rights in these things to the first person who finds it. But he was talking about scarce resources, not about ideas. Um, So I just don't think that that is correct. Now, look. Shakespeare had patrons before copyright. People paid him. Some of the greatest music in world history was written before copyright, uh, you know, the classical era. Um, I've paid photographers to photograph my son, my family on vacation, things like that, and they just give me the disc with the pictures on it, so I'm paying them for their services. I hired them because I saw their website and saw the good work they had done. There is no reason that you can't profit from your skills and from your services, but um, actually there is no property right in ideas. There's a property right in your body and in the physical things in the world that you acquire by contract or that you find unowned in the state of nature, but not in ideas. Ideas are just information and knowledge, and the free market requires competition. And to have competition, people have to be able to emulate each other and copy what other people are doing and try to do it better. Well, now, of course, let's face it, though, at the time that, that, uh, that Locke lived and that Shakespeare lived, they did not have the ability to mass produce things the way we do now, uh, and um, and when especially when you have to put a massive investment into something, we we're talking millions of dollars. It, you could you could lose that before you could recover half of that cost. That's correct, but in, in a, so in a sense, because of technology and the digital age, and uh, it's easier to copy, but it's also easier to uh, to do what Louis C.K. did or do, become an independent author and go around the publishing companies and go to uh, go to iTunes or iBooks. And, and uh, you can do your own textbooks now with, with book author. Um, so it's like a double-edged sword. It gets easier to copy and easier to compete, and we have more production, and it becomes easier to become your own producer as well and to make a profit on your own. Excellent question, Stephen. Thanks for the call. Um, Stefan, we're uh, coming up on the end of the show. Do you have uh, anything else you'd like to say? Uh, did you have a question for me? Uh, well, I, I just want to say, um, you know, uh, Stefan, you, you brought up some interesting points. Uh, I'm still on the fence, uh, but uh, mm-hmm. y- you made me think a little bit, so I appreciate that. Hmm. It's it's it, something I, I might have to it, give uh, it, here, some more thought and to. And here's the other thing, you know, the argument that IP is actually property, it's really not. I mean, like Stefan said, this, you're talking about ideas, and in the case of, like, digital files, you're talking about ones and zeros in a particular order. And to suggest uh, but that, you know, yes. see, that, that argument I don't agree with. I think the the concept itself has value and it it has ownership but how far does that ownership extend i that's i think where let, let me let me suggest something uh first of all there's a really good video uh on i think it's on uh, questioncopyright.org and it's by nina paley it's one of the minute memes it's called copying is not theft one thing to do is to stop using the states and other metaphors that are not accurate so people use the word stealing and theft and piracy to when they're talking about people copying files or sharing files. Now, even if you think it should be illegal or, or, or against the law or or a bad thing or an offense, it do, it is actually literally not stealing because you know if I steal your bicycle, you don't have it anymore. That's what stealing means. But if you have a technique or a file of information and I copy that, you still have it. 
So if I see you making a cake a certain way and I copy your recipe, I may be copying you, but I'm not stealing anything from you. Um, so that's one way to think about it. And I would also, it is a difficult issue, especially if you're used to thinking about it in the standard way. I mean, the, the, the Western system has included these things for 200 years, and so everyone assumes that this is part of property rights. Um, I would say think about it, and there's a lot of good resources on my site, uh, articles by me, books by me, and by other people too, um, on c4sif.org. That stands for Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, C4, the number four, sif.org, on the resources page. So if you want to look into it further, there's a lot of material there. And uh, it is a difficult issue, so I understand uh, um, you're thinking about it like this. Well, Stefan, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, very good stuff. And give that website one more time. C4SIF.org. All right. And we will uh, we will talk to you again. Uh, Stefan uh, Kin- Kinsella. Kinsella, yes. Kinsella. Sorry, I have so much trouble with that, but uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Enjoyed it. All right. And uh, one thing uh, that, uh, you know, like I said, it's, I'm still kind of on the fence. You know, it's it's uh, it's interesting to think about. I, I was on the fence for a long time, too. And, you know, one thing that I um, one thing that helped me out is, you know, I think the caller brought this up that, you know, back in the early days, they didn't have the ability to copy works as easily and still recover their cost for it. You know, if there's something that won't bear a profit in a free market without actually getting a government granted monopoly on it and there's no market demand for it, then it simply won't create it. And, it, and it's no big deal. Yeah, that, that argument doesn't sell me. But, hey, I got to uh, – sorry for the bad segue. I got to switch gears real switch quick. Switch gears. Go ahead. Something I wanted to really touch on, uh, the uh, State Department this week, the Obama administration, killed the Keystone Pipeline. And as uh, we heard from uh, Canada calling, prior Smith reporting from Canada on, hey, he's saying Canada's swimming in oil, guys. All we need to do is get a way to ship it down to you. And a pipeline makes a lot of sense. But you know what? The administration wants to make sure that gas prices are still high. And, uh, you know, there's another player in this game that doesn't get talked about much, and it's Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett realized that, hey, you know what? I have the uh, ability to pressure the government to kill this pipeline, and then I can buy up the only other method of transporting this oil to the United States. All the railroads. And that's what uh, Warren Buffett of uh, Berkshire Hathaway has been doing. Buying railroads up in that section of the world. So guess what? If Canada wants to get that oil, sell that oil to us, that's how it's got to be transported. And remember, remember Brandon touched on it. We have two aircraft carriers in the Straits of Hormuz uh, uh, protecting the flow of oil, yet Canada has so much, and we tell them no thanks. The entire North American continent is swimming in oil. We just got to drill for it and get it to our refineries. It's it's so ridiculous. Putting people in harm's way in the Straits of Hormuz. Yeah, let's start another war for oil Mm -hmm. that's halfway around the planet. And Canada's begging us to take it. It's unbelievable, folks. It just to, you know, this is we got to wipe all these idiots out of all government offices and just get back to to common sense, just logical thinking. Imagine that. Uh, yeah, it's it's not rocket science here, people. We need oil for now. I'm all in favor of renewable energy sources, but let's fix the problem short term first. And then we can, you know, get uh, uh, solar energy. It's great. It's the sun. It's a nuclear furnace in the sky that surprises, is, provides all energy to the entire solar system. Yeah, uh, it's ridiculous. All right. Before the end of the show, if you want to do something tomorrow, the Liberty and Justice for All rally is at Vinoy Park yes. from 2 to 5. I'm be there. Libertarian Sign- Party of Pinellas County is going to be there. Yep. Sign waving for Ron Paul today will be on the west side of the Courtney Campbell Causeway. And, uh, Alex, you talked about the LPF state convention didn't you uh, i'm adrian if you uh oh yeah you know. <laughs> guy that's usually talking i did yeah uh the uh lbf state <laughs> convention is coming up we'll have more information on that soon wow. check out 1787network.com um or lpf.org for more information great show this week guys even without uh, the loud mouth we'll catch you next week this is liberty underground of the 1787 network we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there WTAN Clearwater Tampa Bay, WDCF Dade City Tampa Bay, KLRG 